started. I'm really excited to welcome everyone to our final professional development session of the conference. We have four great people who are going to help be part of this panel. Um, so I'm really going to just turn it right over to Jenny Zlowinski from Purdue University, who will introduce Craig Evers, Bruce Ware, and Gail Harrison Corvett to talk about how they have lived and led a mortarboard life to inspire all of us to continue to be the change. Jenny. Thank you, Kirsten. And I apologize, I'm a little hoarse today, um, so bear with me. Um, again, my name is Jenny Verslowinski, and I am currently one of the alumni representatives on the National Council. And I am so pleased to be the moderator for this session featuring three mortarboard leaders whom I greatly admire. Craig Evers from The Ohio State University, Bruce Ware from the University of Mississippi, and Gail Harrison Corvette from The Ohio State University. You will hear from them shortly. The title of this session is Living and Leading a Mortarboard Life, which is a topic that really hits home for me personally. So if you'll indulge me, I just wanna share that it was 30 years ago that I was tapped for membership into the Barbara Cook chapter of Mortarboard at Purdue by a fellow student by the name of Matt Zolinski, to whom I later got married and have been with for the last 29 years. Um, in the spring of 1994, I had the honor of tapping another Purdue student named Cassandra Lucas into Purdue's chapter membership. And she is about to be installed as Mortarboard's next national president. I proudly joined the Mortarboard National Leadership in 2013. And over the last decade, I have developed deep friendships and working relationships with Mortarboards from around the country that continue today. And just recently in 2021, my daughter, Anna Zelensky, was initiated into Purdue's Mortarboard chapter and served for a year as its president. What a wonderful Mortarboard life. As you can tell from my experience, membership in Mortarboard doesn't end just because you graduate. As Mortarboards, we are all members for life. That means that you have a lifelong opportunity to live the ideals of Mortarboard as you pursue your careers, start families, and get involved in your communities. Our engagement will continue with you into the future, and we hope that your commitment to the ideals of scholarship, leadership, and service will endure as well. Today's session is focused on how you can live your mortarboard life. As you know, the conference theme this weekend is Be the Change, and we would like for you to spend this time that we have together today thinking about how you can be the change in your local community after graduation and beyond. Specifically, we hope that our three panelists today will inspire you to continue to live the mortarboard values of scholarship, leadership, service, philanthropy, and equity after college and into the future. So I'm so honored to welcome our three amazing panelists who will share a little bit, um, one at a time, about their experiences living a mortarboard life and how they have incorporated the mortarboard tenants into their lives and livelihoods. So we are going to start with Craig, who is going to be talking about philanthropy. So Craig, I'll turn it over to you. I'll let Kirsten get the slide deck up. I uh, enjoy using PowerPoint as a, a walking stick. Uh, so uh, forgive me for that. Uh, I'm Craig Evers. Uh, I was initiated into Ohio State's Mortarboard chapter in 2001. I am your Mortarboard National Foundation treasurer. And uh, Gail uh, and everyone else was especially shocked that I was asked to talk about philanthropy, uh, but I will try to do my best. So there's the concept of comparative advantage in economics where even though Gail is better at everything than me, this is where like maybe I can add something so uh, we'll start with title slide. Yeah, I have a journalism degree. Numbers are not my thing. So go for it, Craig. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, go, to, go to full view. Yes, philanthropy and being an agent of change. Uh, we'll go to slide two. And as all good prepared remarks start, we'll begin with Paul Volcker's appointment as Fed chair in 1979. Uh, but because I'm only given 10 minutes, we'll skip ahead about uh, 20 years to slide three. And let me ask, what is philanthropy? Like, literally, it's love for humanity. Uh, in reality, it's charitable acts or other good works that help others or society as a whole. Um, yesterday's session by Jennifer Tosh included a sample budget. And in that sample budget included a line item for charitable donations to incorporate that into your planning, into your budget. And that's great. But I just wanted to take a moment to think about the difference between charity and philanthropy. Charity, uh, charity, 
you can think about immediate, short term. Philanthropy and what I'm going to talk about here is a little more strategic and a little longer term. So we'll move on to slide three. Um, there we go. Um, human beings are wired to process information through stories um, and all of our stories are tied up in each other's stories. I love this quote from Thurgood Marshall, none of us got where we are solely by pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. So next eight and a half minutes, I'm gonna talk about a few other people and their stories and how they've uh, interwoven with my story and how they've taught me about philanthropy. Next slide. Uh, so when did I first start thinking about philanthropy? Uh, that's me holding the torch with epic windswept hair, uh, circa 2002. Uh, Allison Ziski <laughs> holding the flag. Uh, that's that's the uh, class of 01 departing in 02. Um, when I was president of Mortar Board uh, for that 01, 02 year, I got it in my head that I really wanted to establish an endowment for the chapter, to create a sustainable floor of funding for the active chapter to help, because fundraising is hard. It just is. And um, I thought, you know, we could send off emails and letters and phone calls to all the alumni. Like, let's just get this done. Like, let's start this in the next week or two and start collecting money. And the advisors very calmly, very gently said, Craig, that is not really the way to do it. And then over the next 20 years, I've slowly learned how right they were and that I shouldn't have been quite as annoyed as I was at the time. Now we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so philanthropy, I wanna to touch on three topics here. Uh, circled there is me in 2007 with my uh, newlywed wife, Hillary, who worked for the World Wildlife Fund in DC. And that's our uh, first beloved dog, Bosco. Um, when you get to know someone, when you partner up with someone and you start, you know, if you both have jobs and you're talking, talking shop, I learned all about, she worked in development of the World Wildlife Fund. And while I was boring her with inflation dynamics and monetary policy, she was talking to me about uh, talking with donors to the World Wildlife Fund and how it is really about developing uh, your idea of what your priorities and purpose are and then communicating those and finding people whose priorities and purpose are similar. And it's not about exploitation in any way, development and philanthropy are about communication. And furthermore, next slide, it's about developing relationships. Uh, this picture here is from last night's uh, president's reception. You will see five very happy Ohio State alum and one Dower, Michigan alum in the lower right-hand corner. Um, but what I wanna focus on here is in top center, Mabel Freeman, much to her chagrin, has been an important influence in my life and in the life of many Ohio Staters and mortar boards. Um, and she is a good bit of the reason why I joined mortar board, a good bit of the reason why I joined uh, helping at the alumni council for the local chapter uh, after I had my second kid. She was like, uh, I don't care how many diapers you got to change. You can help out at the local level. And then uh, nudging me toward joining a national uh, council um, uh, committee and the board of trustees over time. Um, but in addition to these nudges, she also maintained that relationship by reminding me, Craig, uh, we want to raise funds to create a mortar board room in the main library at Ohio State. And just reminding me of like, hey, Active Chapter is doing this, Active Chapter is doing that. If you're in town, swing by initiation. It's about maintaining, developing, nurturing those relationships. So uh, next slide. And I wanna talk about leadership by example for philanthropy. That right there is Katie Chick, outgoing president. And story here is in 2018, it was my first year on the board of trustees. It was a centennial in Columbus where the national conference was. And I'm, I'm brand new to this place. I barely know anybody. And this lady stands up. We are at a reception talking about all the fundraising work that's gone on for the centennial. Um, this lady stands up and talks about uh, having created an endowment for Mortar Board. 
And I'm looking at her and I'm like, she is not older than me. She is younger than me. This is a remarkable effort. And learning that national leadership feels so strongly about mortarboard and that you can start this earlier than I would have thought. It was a good nudge for me to go ahead and start my own endowment for National Mortar Board. So I want to thank you, Katie. And we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, there is another picture of me with epic windswept hair, uh, arm draped around Mabel and uh, the late Richard Hollingsworth. Um, two wonderful influences on my life. And that's 2003 as I was ready to get off to DC and start uh, post-college work. Uh, and that's really where my philanthropic education started in 03. And from 03, we'll move on to the next slide. That eventually led to the creation of the mortarboard reading room at the Ohio Main Library, Thompson Library, because Mabel kept at it. And she told me like, hey, we're raising funds for this beautiful room in the library. Would you like to donate? And I was like, yes, yes. She communicated the priorities. She kept in touch. And I was like, yes, of course I'll donate. And there's a picture of the main library on the next slide. There it is. It's a lovely room. That was in 2009, I believe. And then 10 years later, uh, on to the next slide. <clears throat> 10 years later, that check is the first check handed out of the Ohio State Chapters Endowment at the National Foundation of Mortarboard. Uh, that was 2019. Um, what I wanted to have happen back in 01, 02, 03, not through my own work, but through the leadership of others, and I was happy to contribute, um, led to this moment. And I was the lucky person who had to hand over the first check. Um, and finally, uh, on to the next slide. Um, this is about your journey and your story. Uh, there's a 20th century philosopher named Yogi Berra who said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. So I encourage you to find your priorities and purpose, establish and nurture relationships, and then lead by example. And uh, on the last slide, uh, I'll remind you one more thing. Uh, keep at it like uh, Paul Volcker did. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. That was amazing. I loved the photos of your windswept hair. Um, but really appreciated um, your focus on priorities and leadership by example and communication. That was um, really inspiring. So now I am going to turn the floor over to Bruce Ware, who is going to talk about service. And he's got lots of great stories to share as well. So Bruce, the floor is yours. Thank you. Give me one moment and let me start sharing my screen here. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be able to connect with um, so many of you and talk about service today. And I thought the best way to start was to just give a little bit of context. Um, I showed up in college in 1995, a first generation kid. I mean, truly in every sense of the word, I was a cultural immigrant. Um, I was inducted into Mortarboard in 1998. And uh, what I will tell you is that education and service from others and to others has really changed my life. Um, a little bit of background on me. Um, I've had the, the, the benefit of, of uh, being able to experience um, and be educated at three uh, academic institutions. I share that because I'm the kid who um, showed up to take his ACT test uh, without a pencil and not really understanding that, you know, I, I mean, literally it's like, um, and so, uh, but it's been people engaged and involved in my life every step of the way who have made the difference uh, for me. And, you know, some, some quotes that really light my fire about service are this, and I, I know you all can read, but I, I, let me read them to you. One is everyone thinks of changing the world but no one thinks of changing himself, Leo Tolstoy. The second is uh, by literary great Toni Morrison. And what she, when she was on the faculty at Princeton, what she told her students is, when you get these jobs that you've been so brilliantly trained to do, 
remember that if you have power, your job is to empower others. If you are free, your job is to set someone free. And then finally, um, a quote by Abraham Lincoln, which you know says, I'm a success today because I had a friend who believed in me and I didn't have the heart to let him down. And I feel a responsibility to believe in others the way that people have believed in me. And it's been so exciting to see the cycle of success in my life. And, and I humbly say that and in the lives of those uh, that I've tried to serve. You know, why do I give and serve others? I mean, in the end, I, I think it's what it's all about. It's what it's all about. Now, some people will say, well, this is what I want to have read at my at my funeral. People, no one may show up to my funeral. I don't care about that. But I think in the end, serving others is where what it's all about. And as Craig pointed out, who can say that they got to where they are by themselves? None of us. I don't care how gifted, how talented, how fast we can run. Um, none of us can say that we got to where we are by ourselves. And then I enjoy giving radically to others as people have given radically to me. And these are pictures of folks who have given radically to me. One of our peers, uh, Jan Farrington. I met Jan as a sophomore in college and she and her husband Lawrence have been in my life ever since. Uh, in the middle here is my wife and I with a picture of James Meredith, who was the first to integrate the University of Mississippi, which is where I got my bachelor's degree. And then this final picture here is <clears throat> my favorite professor who is still living. He's 85. He's a dear friend. Um, when I graduated from college, he said, Bruce, we have to celebrate. And celebrate we did. He threw me a grand party. I don't know how in the world on graduation day he got the president of the university to come, but he did. And um, and so this these are the reasons that I give. I've seen other people give to me. I've experienced it, and I want to 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 replicate replicate that. So I want to tell you briefly about the story of Dennis Pickens. Dennis Pickens grew up in the small town where I grew up. I didn't know Dennis Pickens, but I had a mentor who knew him well. He had interned at his law firm. I called this mentor in 2006, and I know it was 2006. It was the day that I had been admitted to Harvard Business School. And I called the mentor to tell him, I just got accepted to Harvard Business School. And he said, I have a young man. We celebrated that moment over the phone. And he said, I have a young man who's been interning for my law firm. He's a senior in high school here. He's valedictorian. He desperately wants to go to the University of Mississippi, um, but he doesn't have enough scholarship money to go. I met this young man. We turned a $5,000 scholarship into $25,000. And Dennis went on to graduate with a degree in accounting. He earned a master's in taxation. Uh, he was a Rotary Fellow and did uh, um, a master's at University of Edinburgh. And, um, you know, it just gives me great joy to, it was, it gave me great joy to have been asked to have been in his wedding. Uh, probably about 10 years after the day I met him. And so when I think about the stories of the Dennis Pickens of the world, um, it just really, really um, makes me want to serve and to give more. And this is me. I was a groomsman in Dennis's wedding. And uh, though he lives in Atlanta, I live in Dallas. Ironically, this gentleman who's in the photo with us was my campus minister. I just, it's just an interesting factoid that I that I have to share because I think there's something special about giving what you start to notice how your world collides and how you, you you have this kind of flywheel effect that that takes your service to a whole new level. And so finally, um, from uh, our experiences and our observations, my wife and I started a program called the Grisham Fellows Program uh, in honor of my favorite professor who I showed a picture of earlier where we have, these are two cohorts, but since 2014, we have hosted over 125 students for overnight stays at the University of Mississippi. Um, and it's, I think, made a huge difference in their lives. So thank you for the opportunity to share what I, I, I I'm, my, at the beginning, I did not share that I am uh, a national trustee on the Mortar Board Foundation and uh, which has been a real joy and treat. And uh, so I'm really happy to be with you guys today. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Bruce. I absolutely love that concept of giving radically. I had not heard that before, and that's really um, <laughs> inspiring. And I was really inspired about Dennis Pickens, but then at the end, you blew us all away with your service. And um, that's really incredible. Those photos were just amazing. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, our final panelist today knows quite a bit about philanthropy and service, but she is going to talk to you about leadership. And that is my friend, Gail Harrison Corvett. Gail. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'll start with a definition. To lead means to guide something or someone and to bring others along to where you're going. Uh, one of the leadership lessons from our Whova app this weekend, and I found a photo of it, which I'm not going to share with you today, but I put it on Whova. And it's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that really is what leadership means to me. Mortarboard was a tremendous launching pad to the way that I aspire to lead. I was president of the Ohio State chapter, and that was intimidating of all these amazing leaders that voted me to be the president, and I had no idea what I was doing. And leading those um, very outstanding leaders is really an art. Everyone was so smart. Nobody was gonna be lectured or told exactly what I wanted them to do. And I learned quickly that if I dictated, nobody would have ownership in what we wanted, what I wanted to do and nobody would wanna follow. So I would be going alone. So getting that year of experience of leading leaders with Mortarboard was so useful to my entire career in um, human resources consulting. And even now in the volunteer service work that I do, I am on a couple of boards. One um, is called PEO, which supports higher education for women. And the other one, I'm president of the Charleston Symphony Orchestra League, leading 300 volunteers to do fundraising. So after my active year of mortarboard and serving as a volunteer in mortarboard, I became a section coordinator pretty close after I graduated. I began a career in communication consulting at a human resources consulting firm. And the second firm I landed in, we had very good leaders who saw the potential in others. Um, so next slide. One of the leaders saw some potential in me when I was doing communication consulting, and he said, all of your clients do what you ask them to do. You're really good in sales, so you should go into sales. This is the group of uh, partners from my firm who are in sales. You might not notice a lot of women in the group, and um, I was only one of three women in this group around the world as when I began in this sales group. So I've learned through um, many years that the purposes of Mortarboard, so go to the next slide, the purposes of our organization, which you can find on the about um, page of our website, mortarboard.org. Many of these purposes really provide lessons on how to lead, not just the organization of Mortarboard, but how to lead in your life. So I have, um, six quick stories for you that touch on each of these. So the first story on the next slide is to contribute to the self-awareness of our members. This is a woman that um, is, that's something from a podcast that she was interviewed in. And she told a story about how I had um, breakfast with her in London and she was planning on transferring back to our firm to Chicago to do this management job of small market clients. And I said, I don't think that's your potential. You need to come to New York. So she, I intercepted her from where, she, where my boss wanted her to go. And she really thrived in that market. And um, I really took a chance on, on being able to just snag her. And she did a fantastic job. The next is, slide is the advancement of the status of women. When I left, 50% of our firm was women, and that was not when I joined. So um, 
I tried to make a point to hire people who were much smarter than me and let them go. So they would come up with amazing creative ideas of a deal to make with a client. And most of the time I had no idea what they were talking about and I just let them go. I empowered them to make decisions, didn't try to micromanage at all how they got their results, but just encourage them to get their results. And um, I was mentoring a woman in our um, Shanghai office, so the next slide. And I just observed a couple of things that they might do a little bit better in Asia in terms of managing our clients. You can't really see this slide, but that's my boss from Chicago in my retirement party. And it says Gail Corvette's global fit footprint. Um, <clears throat> because I, I, after I observed these things in my trip to Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Beijing, they said, well, why don't you go over to Asia and help us fix some of these things and help train all of our Asian um, associates of how to be in a global firm, how to make sales to these multinational companies that we were working with. So I went over there for two years. No one reported to me. And I was supposed to be helping change the culture and help them be more successful in promoting global relationships with their clients. So I had to lead by influence, encouragement, and example. So the next slide, this is a picture of, um, I, was, I was stationed in Hong Kong and traveled around to our 14 offices or 14 countries in many different offices. And what I ended up doing was telling stories to help catch people doing something well. So I tried to make people look good so they would want to succeed. And we had this sales approach that we focused on six different elements of a process and we called it the moments of truth. So I came up with a little newsletter that was called, Let's Take a Moment. And um, I would find success stories from around the region in Asia and communicate them to the rest of the region so they would not only know what was going on in other parts of the region and the, the world, but that they would want to emulate that and succeed as well. And I knew I was on to something when the Beijing office sold a piece of business for our Seoul office. Next, I want to switch a little bit to current, uh, an example from last year. Oh, this is a thing that they gave the South China Morning Post editorial cartoonist did this thing because I guess they decided that let's take a moment was one of the pivotal things of my leadership when I was in Asia. That was one of the going away presents that they gave to me. So next is um, I was chair of the membership committee for this, this Charleston Symphony Orchestra League, which is an aging volunteers, mostly women who um, do fundraising projects and we are the largest single contributor to the symphony and have been for like 60 years, but we had no young members. So um, we set a goal for getting some younger members. And I found someone who I thought was a great leader and her name was Allison and she's uh, third from the right in this photo. And I, we had one meeting, I only went with them to one meeting we set a big goal of get 40 members under 40 in one year, and I let them go. And so many of the leaders within this nonprofit were so nervous that I wasn't going to every single one of their meetings, and I didn't have a project plan of how they were going to do it. But I recognized in this woman leadership, which is one thing we do in our mortarboard purpose. And guess what? They've gotten 40 new members in one year, and now they're going to start doing fundraising projects for the symphony. So we're really excited about that. And my last little example, which is about the um, establishing the opportunity for a meaningful exchange of ideas, is the last slide. And this is just a little excerpt from the speech that I gave um, at our membership brunch to try to change how this organization approaches leadership. It's been a very top-down, 
very controlling, you know, there are reports and all kinds of things no volunteer wants to do in this day and age. So I am trying to shift to an empowered organization that is positive because there's so many naysayers about, oh, we can't do that. Nobody wants to volunteer anymore. Um, so we're trying to do a little bit of a shift so they can learn some mortarboard style leadership. And that is, you can switch to the next slide or just take the slides down. And another element of how we lead is the torch that you heard during initiation and you heard at the candlelight banquet last night. And it really speaks to how we should lead. We need to follow the torch, follow your heart, engage your team and lead without ego. And the term servant leadership is something that I never really used during my career. But during my retirement party, one of my team members used that term to describe how I lead. And I have Mortarboard to thank for that uh, ability to be a servant leader. And that's it. And we have time for questions as planned, even though I had an internet snafu. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gail, for going with the flow. And I absolutely love how you aligned your leadership with Mortarboard's purpose. That was uh, really special and amazing. And you are a leader in so many ways. Um, with the little bit of time that we have remaining, and I do want to leave some time for questions, we want you to be inspired to think about how you, you especially you students, but also alumni, want to be inspired to lead a Mortarboard life and be an agent of change in your community. And so we're going to encourage you to think about that in the framework of what, so what, and now what as a model of community engagement. So what are you doing? Why does it matter? And what are you going to do next? And so around those areas of philanthropy, service, and leadership, our time is pretty limited. So I think I'm going to open it up to any of those and ask for some students or alumni to share um, what this might have sparked for you in terms of what you're doing, why it matters, and what that could mean for you into the future. So if anybody would like to share, we would love that. Looks like we have a question in the chat from Randy. Thank you, Randy. What specifically in your chapters did you experience that brought this passion to Mortarboard for you? I'll start. I think in the chapter, it was very evident that we needed to get consensus to move forward. And everyone was a very strong leader in their own right. And so leading by example and by encouragement, rather than being a dictator of how we're gonna do things and so my way or the highway kind of a leader, but really to get everyone's ideas, to help everyone get buy into what they wanted to do so that we can move forward. and. Um, I remember I thought I had a great idea to do some service project and it was summarily shot down. And the thing that the group came up with was so much better than what I could have come up with on my own. I'm happy uh, to take a crack at this. You know, I think um, chapters like all organizations go through uh, life cycles and, and ups and downs. And I think um, what I can say for sure, when I was inducted into Mortarboard, that my peers um, that were inducted were super awesome in whatever um, um, you know unique ways they were awesome. However, I don't think that um, I can't say that it was it was uh, that we had a, a, a one kind of singular focus. And so, what I would encourage students to do is if you find yourself in a chapter that does like i think del um, shared great and if you find yourself in a chapter that is probably um needing leadership you be the change um i think if you find a chapter that is probably um restarting or getting going or for whatever reason is is not clicking on all cylinders you be the change and that's what i would inspire people to do so students that you've now that you've had a moment or two to think about it have have you thought about how what you're doing 
in Mortarboard or what you've learned from this conference or, or even this session might inspire you to do in the future to be an agent of change in your community or on your campus. We'd love to hear from a student or two to share some thoughts about what the future might look like for you. You know, Craig shared an example when he was in, in at Ohio State was really inspired and I bet some of you have some ideas that are cooking as well. Love to hear those. Shaw. I think for me, like, one important thing about being, being like on the one of the heads of more board is just like being open to other people's ideas and just be open and and just being open to talk about it and, and help work through the ideas to so that we can perform them together as a team, as a community. Yes, for sure. And I think, you know, Gail really hit on that too, that really being open to ideas um, as a leader of leaders, that um, it was really, for me in Mortarboard, that was really the first time that um, I was with a group where everybody had such amazing ideas and it was um, so important to value all of those ideas and inputs and opinions. That's terrific. Alexander. Um, so yeah, I think uh, one of the, oh, let me get my video going, old camera and very bright. <laughs> um, one of the great things about the community is that like in my own chapter this year, I really also want to focus on, you know, the health of everybody um, as a member, because obviously, you know, we can set our sights on like big goals and things like that, but we can't do it unless we're taking care of ourselves. And that's mentally and physically. Unfortunately, I sometimes don't do that myself. And I, as someone who's going to be a future nurse, uh, you know, that stuff is quite important to me. And I think as a leader, it's okay to recognize that when, you know, someone might need a little help with something or is going through some tough times, whether it's with school or something else, uh, that we, you know, sort of don't dis disvalue that. And we sort of give them time and do our best we can to support them and support each other. That is so amazing. And that, Alexander, thank you for sharing that. I think that's something your generation is doing so much better than my generation. We really weren't thinking about taking care of ourselves and taking care of each other in the same way. And so I think really focusing on the health and wellness of all your chapter members will help you be successful both this year and into the future, for sure. We have time for one other person to share or one more question. I have, I have a question, if there's not one in the, from the students. So as these students start to begin their next year as a mortar board student, but are likely going to be graduating soon for many of them. Kind of if, what's the best thing you can do, especially what's the best thing they can do right after graduation to kind of continue down that trend? Like I think they've gotten to this point of their life in mortar board because they've been active and engaged and have shown a commitment to service and leadership and scholarship and philanthropy and equity and all the topics that we're talking about this weekend of around being the change, but how do they then kind of leave and go into the real world, so to speak? And how would you advise them to be able to do that the most seamlessly? Become a section coordinator. Um, as, as you move on to this next phase of your life, um, you're going to build new communities, but it's also important to, to maintain those relationships that you've built. Um, so it's, it's very easy if you're, you know, I left Columbus to go to DC and it became very easy to let some of those relationships wither on the vine. Mabel wouldn't let that happen with me, which I appreciate, but, um, maintaining those communities that you've built over this past year to keep up with them, celebrate their successes. And, you know, 20 years down the line, you can be like Patience and me teasing each other at a national conference, uh, teaching the next generation of mortar boards what it means to be a mortar board. Yeah, and what I would tell you is two things. One is uh, remembering your roots, which I think is what Gail is getting at. Like, um, for example, think about when you leave your chapter in your university, who's going to be a great mortar board? So one, remember your roots. And then second is, as you're executing on your future, um, don't be 
bashful or shameful about reaching out to people that can help you. People want to help you, especially if they see that you have the inclination to help others. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists, Craig, Gail, and Bruce. We appreciate you so much. And I, I know that I personally was very inspired and I hope that our students and alumni in attendance were as well. So I will turn things over to Kirsten who will lead us into what I think might be our final session of the day. Well, thank you to all of the panelists. I did see that Sarah came in late. So Sarah, we will at some point show you um, Craig's slides because you made his slides. So just so you know that. Um, but at this point, it is my privilege to turn the session over to Madam President Katie Chick to lead our final business meeting of the day. Um, thank you to Jenny, Craig, Bruce, and Gail for your inspiration. And I am looking forward to the final session.